Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar on empathy and education, where we will be discussing the role of teacher mindset um, in student outcomes. And so we have with us today uh, Dr. Jason Okanafua, and I'll be passing on to him in just a little bit, but I have just a few things to share before we um, pass it on. Uh, my name is Connie Silva, and I am the director of the State Performance Plan Technical Assistance Project. And this webinar is brought to you with funding from the California Department of Education um, as part of our project at the Napa County Office of Education. Um, we are very happy to have you all with us uh, today. And we know folks are just joining right now. So um, that's good. We're giving them time to, to step in as I just give us our, our hellos and welcomes. So um, if you could just go ahead and chat, we'd like you to tell us who you are. Uh, just give your, your, we'll see your name, but let me know what educational agency you work with, um, whether that's a SELPA or a district or a county office. Um, and I know there are many familiar faces on here or, or names is like are popping up. Um, I know this is a very, very busy times and unusual time. So i uh, very uh, pleased for those of you that are able to join us today. Thank you for taking the time to be with us. Um, as we participate on this webinar, we're asked that you use chat. So if you wanna have questions or comments you wanna share, please go ahead and put those in chat as we um, start the, the session. I do know that it, we are gonna be saving questions for the end. So um, Jason has made sure to save some time at the end so we can have those questions posed um, as we end the webinar. And we also will have some web um, polls. So you'll see those pop up from time to time where we'll ask you some questions. As you put in chat, please make sure that you change. You'll notice on that little blue bar that you can reply to all hosts and panelists and um, or to everyone. So you wanna make sure that you have it changed to it's everyone so that we can all see your, your questions and your comments to share. Thank you. As a reminder, we do record our webinars. It's important to us that we're able to archive these for future use for anyone who wasn't able to be with us today. Um, also folks that watch it often share it with their colleagues. So um, we are definitely recording this session. Okay, so thank you. I'm, I'm seeing all the, all the faces, all the names that I know in the um, chat. So welcome to everyone. I hope you're all doing well. So um, we are very, very excited to have uh, Jason, Dr. Okonafuo here with us today. Um, he has wonderful information to share with you, so relevant to the work that we are doing um, and that you are doing to support equity in our different educational settings. So let me just take a moment to tell you a little bit about Jason. Uh, he's the assistant professor at the University of California, Berkeley. He was trained at Stanford University under the guidance of Jennifer Eberhardt. Gregory Walton and Carol Dweck. Jason's research examines social psychological teacher student processes that contribute to racial disparities in discipline and other student outcomes. He also designs and tests large scale psychological interventions for school administrators, jails, prisons, and court departments. And in one of his latest interventions, half suspension rates in middle schools across three different school districts from a rate of 9.6 to 4.8. It's a very significant um, change. And the intervention was geared towards shifting teachers' mindsets to show more empathy towards students and shifting student mindsets to be more agentic and motivated to value education and succeed in school. So you can see how this is really gonna be meaningful to all of you that are here. Um, his research has been published in top journals um, including Psychological Science and the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The work's been funded by Google, the Tides Foundation, the Character Lab, and the Bureau of Justice Statistics. And it's been featured in a number of media um, outlets, including National Public Radio, The New York Times, MSNBC, Reuters, Huffington Post, Daily Mall, 
um, Daily Mail, sorry, Wall Street Journal, and Education Week. So uh, you may have heard of Jason before, and so that's why we're so thrilled to have him here. If you haven't heard of his work, you're going to be very excited. So I'm going to pass it on to Jason. Thank you so much, and welcome. Thank you again for being with us today. Good morning. Nope. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Uh, first of all, I just wanna thank everyone for being here with us today. Um, I don't think educators and people up and down the education system receive enough thank yous, um, especially during these times, as I was telling my colleagues. Um, my daughter was diagnosed with COVID uh, yesterday. Um, I'm still, <laughs> I still don't, I'm still taking all that in. But that just also is a reason why I think it's very important to start and end with uh, expressing an immense amount of appreciation for the work you all do day to day uh, throughout all of this and before and after uh, a pandemic was even here. Um, you know, we're going to work on making sure that she gets better and then hopefully can send her back so that uh, uh, you professionals can help her learn and grow and become her best possible self. And so with that, just going to uh, jump right in to make sure that we are able to get as much as we can out of today's session, uh, given that I suspect a lot of us are facing a number of uh, things on our plates. Um, and so thank you for that introduction, Connie. Um, typically in my classes and in sessions, especially when it's later in the day, I like to lighten it up a little bit, at least at the beginning, and just do some I don't know, when I was a kid, they were called brain teasers, but just um, something uh, to get our cognitive juices flowing so that we can then take on the science that I'll be sharing with you all that can be applicable in practical ways. Um, and so in this, you know, really brief task, um, the objective is to count as many shapes uh, in a figure as possible. Um, and so on this next slide, I'll show you this image or this figure. And as quickly as possible, you want to count the number of triangles in the, the slide um, and enter that information into the chat um, as soon as you can. So it's all about quick, critical thinking um, and being able to complete a task as quickly as possible. So is everyone ready? Let me open up my chat <laughs> uh, so that I can see the numbers as they come in. Um, Okay, here we go. So as quickly as possible, how many triangles are in this image? It's quick, very quick, very good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll stop there. Don't want to spend too much time on it. We have a number of responses. Uh, and so I'm going to call out just the first ones I saw Josh Rucker and Miriam Galvarin. Um, these two people said zero, which is the correct answer. And so I apologize. That wasn't exactly solely a cognitive task, um, but I, it wasn't just to mess with you. I'll explain in a moment. Um, let me. Sorry, I'm going to close this window so you don't hear a garbage truck outside. Yes, so the correct answer is zero because as you know, a triangle is something that has three sides and there is no such shape in this image. However, what happened is that due to the circumstances, due to me requesting that you uh, make a decision as quickly as possible due to this being noon and on Wednesday in the middle of the week, and we might be depleted of our cognitive resource. Sorry about all the jargon. We might be tired uh, uh, at this time and that we needed to make a decision quickly. And so what happens in that type of situation, consciously or subconsciously, our brain uh, fills in information to make this image less ambiguous and allow us to complete the task. And the point here is that that is how bias works. That is when and where implicit bias can shape our decision-making. And so I'll be coming back to this. I didn't just do this to play with everyone <laughs> this morning, I mean, this afternoon. Um, but yeah, and so let's, let's, let's talk about that. And so what we know from the scientific community uh, is that biases are all around us. 
um, and it, within all of us. Um, and so first, just for some language and understanding uh, how this is communicated in the scientific community, um, is that the way we make sense of the world around us is schematic, or it can be based on scripts or existing uh, networks of mental associations. Um, put differently, we, it would be impossible for us to process all of the information that happens around us uh, in any given moment or multiple moments. Um, for example, the fact that we're able to uh, be in traffic, busy intersections, things of that nature, and somehow our minds can hone in to the sound or sight of siren uh, and our actions automatically being, okay, how do I get out of the way? Um, that type of thing allows us to function in an efficient way. And so social cognition is also schematic. And so the way we uh, 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 make sense of social interactions and of other people, that's similar. And so just to give us the language here, because oftentimes these words are used interchangeably, but they shouldn't be. Uh, first is a stereotype. A stereotype is the actual association between a thing uh, or, or a group and an idea. And so, for example, Black people, bad. That's a stereotype. Black people, violent. That's a stereotype. Um, prejudice is a person's entire belief system, uh, their attitude about a certain group uh, that 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 exist in their minds, um, whereas discrimination is the actual behavior of treating someone differently according to that information from stereotypes or prejudice. And so it's important to distinguish those um, as we go into what we're talking about when we look into the science of this. Um, and so before you know, getting into those weeds, just to be clear, bias is normal. What has become to understand we what we've come to understand about bias, you know, in general, uh, comes with negative connotations. Um, but it, it it's kind of misleading because actually we have many many biases. What's negative or what's taboo are when we make errors in our bias and that affects other people. But bias is also the same thing that allows us to pay attention to things and not think about other things, like what we need to do when we're studying, when we're creating our lesson plans, when we're creating our school plans, things of that nature, to tune out everything else that's going on and pay attention, that's bias. You're tuning out very specific things. Um, and so it's very useful and, and necessary for us to function as human beings, uh, but it's not necessarily desirable. And so where it is, and this goes all the way back to evolutionary psychology, um, bias allows us to categorize. And so uh, blueberries and red berries, those are two different categories, the blue ones and the red ones, and they all are in a, a category of berries. That's bias. Perceived correlations. The red berries tend to be poison. I tend to get sick after I eat the red berries. So it will be safe for me to just consider all berries that look red to be ones that I shouldn't eat, that I shouldn't pick that I shouldn't bring back to my family. And instead, I'm going to focus on the other berries. And so that's allowing us to perceive correlation so that we can function and survive. It also, you know, an evolutionary allows us to distinguish and understand who's on our side and who's against us. That allowed uh, uh, humans to avoid dangerous predators and be able to interact and engage and work with animals that can be helpful, like mammoths pulling very heavy things. And it also allows us to make quick judgments when we have limited information, like what happened in that triangle task uh, we, we went through as we started this. And that in that situation, it allows us to complete the task so that we can move forward. And so the issue is like, tends to be with that perceived correlation or that stereotype. And when there's an error, that can be problematic. And so that's where we'll be talking a lot uh, today about what's going on there. And so to start, the way we understand it from a scientific standpoint is in two different bins, and that's explicit bias and implicit bias. And we look at it categorized in two different ways based on awareness and control. Explicit bias is bias that we're aware of. This is how I feel about that group. I think women are not as good at math as men. That, that's inaccurate, but that that would be an explicit type of bias, whereas implicit bias we're not aware of we might indeed act on that thought or that process without even knowing 
that that's what's going on or that's why we're making the decisions that we're making. And then there's control. And so explicit bias is more deliberate. It's more of an intentional uh, type of bias in which I actively feel this way about that group, whereas the implicit bias is more automatic uh, uh, and involuntary. It just shapes the way that we think. And as I was talking about with that you know, triangle task at the beginning, we in the scientific community have been able to pinpoint uh, what type of context or, or situations are likely to allow bias to shape our decision making that will bring out our bias selves. Um, uh, uh, and that's ones that uh, when we have limited energy, like we're tired or our resources are depleted, we're, we don't have all of our functioning. Uh, when we need to make extremely rapid decisions, quick uh, uh, decisions like in that triangle task, also when there's ambiguity, like the ambiguity of that image, and we just need to figure out what to do, those are times when bias is likely to shape our behavior. And so here, I just want to make clear uh, a point that I'll be coming back to, because we'll be turning this conversation specifically to education. And I need to make it clear, I in no way am pointing a finger at teachers or any educators or school leaders as the source of the problem, not at all. What I'll be coming back to is that, like I've just described, situations that, for example, teachers are in as a part of their job are contexts in which it's likely that bias can shape decision-making. That means any person, any human that's assuming that role with those parameters may be more likely to be affected by bias and that bias affecting their decision-making. Or if you're a principal and you're managing an entire school with hundreds of students, um, you have a lot of things you need to manage and think about and may not have your full capacity of cognitive resources at the moment that a student misbehaves, for example. And you need to make a quick decision so that you can get back to caring for and making sure that the rest of the school is safe. Those are the type of context in which implicit bias can shape our interpretation of things that are happening around us. And it's not just an education or school setting thing. This is what's seen in military situations, what's seen in workplaces, when you have a manager needing to manage many employees, also do a lot of work in criminal justice. This is what was faced by probation and parole officers who have a docket of 100 people on probation and parole that they need to be thinking about and managing. And so just to be clear here and early, we're gonna be thinking about the context um, and I'll be coming back to that. But first, how do we measure bias? And so to get this point or to make this point, we wanna do this in a more interactive way. Um, and so I'll show you exactly how it's measured um, and we'll all go through it together. And so one way of measuring implicit bias uh, is based upon or, or done in a quite simple, simple way of fill in the blank. And so it's a, a word that's presented and there's a letter missing and you're just gonna try to figure out what is that word as quickly as possible. And so do note that we're gonna keep looking at the same type of word, but there's gonna be different things surrounding it um, as you'll see. And so for example, this would be the first one. And so in the chat, please enter how you would finish this word. Saying hot, I'm saying O's, exactly, that's right. And here comes the next one. How would we fill in this word? Precisely, with a U, hut, exactly. And this one? That's right, we're saying A's for hat. And then this one. Y'all see that? People stop responding. It takes longer to respond. And then eventually, yes, what comes to mind is likely an I. Why? Because there's a stereotypic association between blackness and aggression, blackness and violence. In the same way that those other associations, what immediately came to mind was related to that context is happening here. However, it may take longer to fill in the blank, to put in that word, because we have to consciously uh, 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 remember, oh, that's taboo. That's not something that I want to say. That's not, that, that doesn't look good. Um, and I literally, I'm not a racist consciously. I don't want to make those associations. But even the, and that's the measurement, how long it takes us to make that adjustment and then decide how we're going to fill in that word. It's really not about what letter is put into this figure or is put into this uh, hidden letter. Um, 
rather it's about how long it took to answer it compared to the other ones. That is a measure of implicit bias. And there's other ways of measuring implicit bias that are very similar. For example, the implicit attitudes test or the IAT, which came out of Harvard, pretty much does the same thing. How quickly can we associate one thing with another thing? Um, I'm sorry, thank you in the chat, the implicit associations test. And you can indeed follow that link and participate in, uh, participate in it yourself. And you'll see that it's also about just response times. How quickly do we categorize things as a measure of what are the stereotypes that we've been exposed to? And so at this point with the, the, the number of, 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 of science-based ideas of how we understand bias, we'd like to take a pause here uh, and just as a group in a more interactive component before we go into the next section, um, answer these questions. And so the first one, what stereotypes do you know of? There are no wrong answers. And long story short, we're all exposed to the same ones. Um, and so please uh, 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 enter into the chat how you would answer that question. That's a that's an interesting one. Women are more compassionate than men. That's what quick tangent, that's what's called benevolent sexism, where it's seemingly a good stereotype, but it's restrictive. All Asians good at math, that would be a similar one, uh, but actually that leads to a lot of stress. Men are unemotional. I've experienced that one. For the first time as a parent, I've experienced discrimination and prejudice against men. Everyone's surprised when I'm walking my daughter down the street in a stroller. Yes, yes, all of these. Okay, great. And I hope that as people look at this in the chat, you're seeing that, you know, we all are exposed to the same stereotypes. These are not new things that we're seeing for the first time. Here's the second question. Why do you know these stereotypes? And so where has that information come from? Where does that association come from? If you think about it, Very good, yep. <laughs> and as you can see, many people have the same sources, media, experience, long story short, the things that we have been around, the things that we have been exposed to have given us these, these associations. Um, and so then finally, last question, why do some people act on these stereotypes? Fear. Mm hmm Habit, precisely. Mm hmm We'll be coming back to these things. Ignorance, yes. Unaware, absolutely. Ideology, yep, yep. That's something that can say that this is a good thing to do or a bad thing to do. Excellent. Um, and so, yeah, the a main takeaway here, and the reason why we wanted to do that in the chat is to just make it clear that this isn't an individual thing, actually we're all exposed to these same stereotypes. Um, and that there is an open question of like, so then why does it seem to affect some people and not others? That's something that we'll come back to. And so from there, or before we come back to that, let's shift to something that we hope to dig into today. What do we do about the bias? And this is where uh, I hope the main takeaways are gonna come from today. What do we do about it? And so one of the classic or um, uh, um, yeah, typical ways that we've thought of approaching this in the, at least the last three decades has been to try to reduce people's bias, try to de-bias people. Um, and so a meta-analysis, uh, or first let's start with a scientific experiment that tried to get at this. It's called an intervention tournament in which they tried a number of different approaches to try to reduce people's uh, anti-Black implicit bias in this case. Um, and so you're about to see a lot of text, but just the point is, is that they tried a number and a variety of different approaches to reduce people's uh, anti-Black implicit bias. And so they would do one of these things, a participant would do one of these things, and then immediately thereafter, they would take that IAT test to see uh, the extent to which they showed anti-Black implicit bias. 
This was done as a randomized controlled trial, which is the same way that we're determining whether vaccines work or not. Uh, and so it's the most rigorous uh, scientific method that we have to bear. And it allows us to just be able to compare efficacy, which of these are effective and which ones are more or less effective than the others. And so don't be intimidated by any of these slides that you're seeing numbers or graphs or anything on. That's not what I'm trying to do here. This isn't a statistics class. Um, this is about practice. This is about what can actually be used and applied in schools. And it's important that we understand the science first. And so the thing to focus on when it comes to these dots and lines and numbers is that those that the scale the, the horizontal axis, those numbers, those are effect sizes. And so that's just determining how big was the effect of this particular approach. And in the scientific community, what's considered a weak effect, a minimal effect, uh, uh, the basis upon we can say, be uh, uh, with a reasonable amount of scientific certainty that there is at least some type of effect, a weak effect. That's a point three uh, on this scale. And so if you follow the, the red line here, you're seeing that most of these approaches that were based in all of the scientific theoretical uh, uh, research to date, but then also pervasive uh, uh, approaches and practice to uh, have implicit bias trainings or uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion trainings, that most of these were not effective at reducing either implicit bias or explicit bias. And so on a number of these slides, I'm including uh, the actual citation, because I encourage you to follow up and look into it yourself. I don't think we in the scientific community do a good enough job of sharing what we know and what we found. So this might be news. Um, I imagine for the most part, this is news. Um, and so not only did they find that most of these were not effective and only a few of them uh, uh, that were effective, that that effect was actually weak, like right on the bare minimum, but then they also looked at how long this effect lasted, and they found that the even the ones that were that had that weak effect, that effect was short lived. It only lasted for like five minutes to thirty six hours, um, um, upon which the anti black implicit bias just returned. And so this takes us to previous research, or, or, or I want to share with you research that can help us understand why these approaches may not have been effective. And so in 2008, research by um, Kristen Parker and Nalini and Body, published in Science Magazine, uh, looked at where my bias come from. They showed participants uh, uh, video clips from the most popular TV shows out at the time. I don't watch a lot of TV, but it was a lot of letters like NCIS, SVU, Grey's Anatomy, Scrubs shows that had at least 10 million viewers per episode. They took those, 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 those shows, they got an episode uh, and they looked for the first interaction in the episode. They took a very brief clip of that interaction, about five seconds, and then they removed all audio from that clip such that all you're seeing is five seconds of people interacting on that show. And they categorized them by, you know, white person interacting with white person or white person interacting with black person. Um, and uh, it was a series of experiments. I encourage you to check it out. It's interesting work. Um, it's published in Science Magazine, which is the most rigorous scientific journal that we have across all sciences, chemistry, physics, biology, whatever it may be, because of how well this was done. Uh, but long story short, what they found is that by just showing them that very brief, silent clip of interactions between a white person and a Black person, that increased people's anti-Black implicit bias as measured by the IAT. And so let's just take a step back from that. This happened in a controlled lab setting. They're sitting in a room. They're just looking at this brief clip, uh, no audio. So what they're all they're doing is being exposed to nonverbal communication. How are they interacting with each other? And so then if we consider that or think about that outside of the lab, that means just watching these shows, but also just watching a brief part of these shows, the show being on the TV in the room, but not the audio's down, you're just being exposed to it. But it's also specifically nonverbal communication, meaning it doesn't even have to be on TV. It could be walking through an airport. 
walking through a grocery store, being in a restaurant and seeing how people are interacting and treating each other, that can increase one's anti-Black implicit bias. And so I'll be focusing our, our understanding specifically on, on race right now, but it, it's important to understand that's not the only type of bias and these processes act in the same way across these different type of biases. If you follow that link to participate in the IAT, you'll see a long list of different types of biases that you can test for. But the point here is that, so even if you're able to somehow reduce somebody's bias, they're then up against a tidal wave of sources for that bias to just come back. And that's what those approaches have to contend with. That doesn't mean those approaches shouldn't be uh, looked into or, or developed and try to find out how best can we work on reducing bias. But it does give us context for why that's a tall order that we are, we are embarking upon. And it's going to take much more time and work to find uh, ways that that can indeed be effective. And so something that I hope to share with you all today is to not leave you feeling down, uh, but indeed to share with you exactly where the science is and that we indeed have some promising uh, approaches uh, on what to do about that. But first, let's, let's take another moment on this deep biasing thing before we leave it. And so just, this is another that, that slide with all the text and dots on it. But just let's, let's take an example. And so let's look at the most effective one there, the top one, it says vivid counter stereotypic scenario. And so just bear with me for a minute. So I, I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, which is considered one of the most dangerous uh, cities in the country. It's actually not Chicago. It's more like Baltimore and Memphis. Um, and I'm specifically from North Memphis. That is the part of town where your car will get stolen. Um, but from there, around the 10th grade, I received a full scholarship to go to an elite prep school on an island off the coast of Rhode Island called St. George's. From there, I matriculated to get uh, multiple degrees from Northwestern University outside of Chicago. From there, I received an offer to be paid to earn my master's and PhD from Stanford University. Thereafter, without even applying, I was given an offer to be a professor at the University of California, Berkeley. I own property here in California and yeah, that, that's significant. And I do pat myself on the back. All of my taxes are paid on time and often uh, in advance due to you know, estimated taxes and how my, anyway, I have no criminal history whatsoever. I, um, am not on welfare. Yeah, and all of that, all these things I just said, they were done by the time I was 31 years old. And so if you haven't noticed, I'm a black person and I am here interacting with you right now. So this would be a vivid counter stereotypic scenario because there are stereotypes about black people that they're lazy, uneducated, prone to criminal behavior, likely have a history of uh, uh, of criminal or, or criminal history, uh, don't pay taxes, welfare queens, um, all of these things. And I just gave you a very vivid story of how mm, counter stereotypic. And so the point here is to what extent right now would you imagine that all of our anti-Black implicit bias is gone? And if it is gone, how long would it be gone? until this session is over, until later when we relax and we turn on the TV and a commercial comes on, until we run out of groceries and need to run to the grocery store again. I think, I think, yeah, hopefully that helps to make the point and help to drive it home. Um, but let's table that for now, the idea of getting rid of people's bias. Um, and all the reasons why I told you about how it's actually more nuanced than that, because bias allows us to function as humans, et cetera, et cetera. Let's instead switch to what, you know, where all the takeaways are going to come from today is a new approach that, that, that's been developed in the last five to 10 years. Um, fortunately, you're, I hate this term, but hearing it from the horse's mouth, I have led the teams at Stanford University and you see Berkeley that have indeed considered this new approach and have tested it, and I'll be sharing all of that with you today. But first, let's 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 consider a lay of the land. Or, yeah, we'll come back to it. But the approach is to focus 
instead on the consequences of bias as opposed to the bias itself. We'll come back to that. But first, lay of the land. Over the last several decades, there was an explosion in suspension rates, exclusionary discipline, meaning that it removes children from the learning environment um, uh, uh, and often can lead students to be uh, at a higher risk of other social uh, issues. Uh, and so these policy, this is often uh, connected to zero tolerance policies that were introduced in schools across the country that were geared towards making schools more safe, but ended up being uh, many more students being suspended, not for bringing guns to school or bringing drugs to school, but rather things that are more subjective in nature, things that are more interpersonal and not easily defined, uh, which we'll be coming back to. But as you might remember, that's similar to the ambiguity we were talking about in the triangle example, context in which implicit bias can shape our decision making. And so that, this is all data that I uh, uh, collected and working with the U.S. Department of Education. And so we're, we're talking about throughout the country. Um, and what we're seeing here is that throughout the country, uh, Black students make up about 17% uh, of the total student population. Um, I should have updated the slide, but they've recently released the more to date data. And I can assure you, it looks the same. Um, However, if you look at these green bars, that's looking at the percent of students who were suspended in a given year. And so just looking at the green bars, you're seeing that black students were more likely to be suspended than white students. But then if you look at the green bars compared to the blue bars, that's what we call disproportionality, such that actually black students are up to six times more likely to be suspended than their white peers. I'm just gonna quickly point out uh, that uh, we see similar rates, but it's more of a mixed effect and it varies more when it pertains to Latinx students. Um, for Native American or American Indian students, it's a much higher rate, but it's more difficult to stand on it scientifically, scientifically because there's so few records of those students um, across the country. Um, Asian American students, uh, are their, their rates look more like white students. However, they're even less likely to be suspended. White students and Asian students or Asian American students are the only students that are consistently underrepresented when it comes to exclusionary discipline. So that's just to give us a lay of the land of what's going on. All those things I just told you about, those are correlations. An important thing to know uh, from a scientific standpoint is that correlation does not mean causation. Just because things uh, happen at different rates for different people doesn't mean uh, that we can say why that's happening. And that's where experimental design is necessary. And so before I get into the experiments to, so we can really dig in here and see what's going on, um, I'd like to show you an example of how this might play out instead of walking you through decades of theoretical research um, that indeed you can find and will be shared with you, uh, a theory paper about 60 pages long uh, that I published years ago. Um, but instead, you can just follow this a working model of how this might play out. So if we imagine a student, let's say the student's name is Darnell. Darnell does something minor, subjective. He's passing notes in the back of the class or he's whispering to a student next to him. This is a disruption to the class. And so in a teacher's mind, this is hindering me from maintaining control over my classroom. And as a part of my job and my duty to maintain control over my classroom for the sake of all students in the classroom. And so I need to respond in some way from, to stop this from happening keep my class on track. And so let's say this teacher's name is Ms. Smith. Ms. Smith does something about it. Maybe she gives Darnell a verbal warning. Maybe she asks Dar or assigns Darnell a day or two of uh, detention. Uh, let's imagine she did that. In turn, this could communicate to Darnell uh, that this is a confirmation that he won't receive a fair shot in, uh, in this class. That being due to his actual past experiences, past experiences from his family, him being exposed to the same media and environments as everyone else that lets him know that there are negative stereotypes about his group that can make him be particularly vigilant to cues that he's not gonna be treated fairly. And when people feel that way, anyone feels that way, they don't wanna be there anymore. They disengage. They may be less interested in participating or cooperating in different activities. Uh, and so let's say Darnell did that. In turn, this could communicate in Ms. Smith's mind that this is gonna be an ongoing uh, pattern of misbehavior, uh, that this is gonna be a consistent thing. Maybe this is a, a bad kid or a troublemaker. Um, and in turn, Ms. Smith may respond with a behavior that's a somewhat more severe disciplinary action, like more days of suspension, 
or uh, referring the student to the office to get a, a assistant principal or principal involved. As you can imagine, this isn't a one on encounter between one party and the other. Like, for example, how police interact with civilians often, it's like a one on encounter. Rather, as you know, in the education context, the relationship with these students, whether it be teachers or school leaders, is an ongoing relationship that exists across many months, often an entire year. And so we can imagine over the course of time, what used to be minor infractions can become major infractions, that this teacher-student relationship can continue to deteriorate and lose trust and respect for one another, such that ultimately we see uh, the bigger outcome, more exclusionary discipline, more suspensions frequently, and more severe discipline for the Black child compared to other students. Again, you can check out the theory paper, but it actually it spells that out based on prior research on this topic uh, that spans sociology, education, law, and psychology about this is indeed seems to be the case and that this would escalate over time. It will build in the fashion of a recursive cycle or a snowball effect, like you're rolling a snowball, it just gets bigger and bigger. And so where we focus or what we've been talking about today has to do with the bias, implicit bias, things get, that can affect the educator in this process. But I just wanna be clear, and that's why I presented it this way, there are many different parts of this process where things can be broken down and that it's a recursive cycle, not a straight line, meaning it doesn't need to start with one person or the other person. It just keeps going around. Um, but that also to be, there's bodies of research on what that perspective of that student is like and how some students uh, 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 may indeed feel things like stereotype threat work done by one of my advisors, Claude Steele, it says that when people fear being the victim of discrimination, they don't wanna be there. But also work out in New York on procedural justice such that anyone who has a supervisor or someone in a position of authority over them, and you can probably imagine this in your experience and jobs that you've had, if you feel like a supervisor isn't gonna treat you fairly, you don't want that job anymore. You don't wanna be there. It, bodies of research have shown that um, this leads to rebellion, lack of cooperation, incivil incivility, protest, a whole number of things that in this context would be classifiable as infractions worthy of discipline. And so there's just, there's multiple things going on here. But then there's also an additional, I'm sure you all know, additional things going on beyond this. Things that go on beyond the school environment in the first place that feed into all of these things that are not in the control of the educators and the educators are in a position where they need to do what they can given what they have. Um, and so just making that all clear to now say, let's just take a moment and look at this teacher's mindset for a second. And by the end of this, I promise you, you'll see why. And long story short, the educator happens to be in a pivotal position to do something about this process to change it. That doesn't mean it's their fault, but that means they are in a unique and pivotal position um, to, to turn this around. And so before getting to that, what is this teacher's mindset? Do teachers indeed respond differently uh, uh, to misbehavior based on the race of the student misbehaving? Well, uh, my team and I, we looked into this, um, we surveyed teachers from across the country, uh, hundreds of teachers. I'm gonna show you the results of one experiment, but there's been multiple. It's been replicated a number of times. Another publication is about to come out in some months. Um, so just to be clear, we have reasonable amount of scientific certainty that this is something that affects teachers across the country. We ask them to imagine themselves as an educator or teacher at this school. We then show them a misbehavior pretty much this one, um, and, and uh, unbeknownst to them, they had been randomly assigned in this experiment to be reading about a student with a stereotypically white name or a stereotypically black name, and so Jake or Darnell. Another thing about this is that this is what would be classified as a classroom disruption. Um, this is taken word for word from actual office referral forms from uh, school districts here in California, and indeed this is or was classified as a classroom disruption. Um, so this is just one example, uh, uh, but they would read this and then we'd ask them a series of questions. The first question would be, uh, how severe is this misbehavior? How irritated are you by this student? How hindered do you feel uh, from maintaining control over your classroom? And we averaged across those into an outcome that we call feeling troubled. 
And what we found is that there was no racial difference uh, in how trouble, or there was no difference in how troubled teachers felt based upon whether that student was white or black. Those bars might look different, but statistically they're the same. We also asked teachers how severely they'd wanna discipline the student. And again, there was no difference based upon the student's race. It's exactly the same. And this is what it should be because the misbehavior is exactly the same. It's what you just read. The only difference is the name of who did it. And so back to the example I was giving um, about it being a cycle that plays out over time, not one on encounters, I set up the experiment to do exactly that. And so then teachers are told that three days pass and this student misbehaves again. Here's an example of that second misbehavior. Again, this is something minor. It's not bringing guns to school. It's not fighting. Um, it's not bringing drugs to school. It's not something major or objective like that, like it is or it isn't. Are the drugs in the backpack or not? Rather, it's something minor and subjective in nature. And so just, I've been saying this subjective word. What I mean is that it's open to interpretation. Um, sorry, I shouldn't be reading the chat as I talk. Uh, it's open to interpretation such that if I ask 10 people right now, what does disrespect look like? We would likely get eight different responses because it can look different. And so for example, I'm half Nigerian on, and half black American. My Nigerian side, I was raised that if an adult is talking to you, you put your head down, you look down, and that that's a sign of respect. My Black American side says that if an adult was talking to you as a kid, you look them in their eye, and that that is the show of respect. The point being, respect is open to interpretation, uh, and that it can vary, and that like that triangle task, it's in those situations that bias can shape the way that we respond. And here, when we look at the responses to the second misbehavior, now there is a significant difference such that teachers feel significantly more troubled by the misbehavior if it's by a black child compared to a white child. And an important thing about it is what's happening from the first infraction to the second. What you're seeing is a sharper escalation in how troubled they feel if the student is black compared to white. And that's what we call a black escalation effect. And if we go back to thinking about that recursive cycle, that's meaning that for that black student, there's a sharper escalation in how those minor infractions uh, uh, can ultimately lead to major uh, discipline outcomes. And so we saw the same when it came to discipline severity. Now, teachers want significantly more severe discipline for the black student compared to the white student for the exact same misbehavior. And that we see that escalation over time. Um, stop reading that. But I, I think it's a good point to make. Right now we're talking about race. Please think about also special education. Uh, I wanted to make this point later, but I'll make it now, that the bias processes I'm talking about, disability, different abilities, uh, eligibility for special education, those are all things that would function in a similar way, such that there are stereotypes about that group, about how they're going to be, the amount of uh, control they have over it. Yeah, I'll come back to it, but do keep in mind that these things will be applicable. We're talking about race and it's going to be applicable, applicable to those different things as well. Um, and I'll come back to that. Thanks for that question, uh, Sarah. Okay, and so that was just asking severity of discipline, but how about something more specifically like, um, to what extent do you predict or think the student will be suspended down the road? And here again, they, teachers were more, significantly more likely to think so or predict that if the student was black compared to white. We'd like to make the point again here, these are minor misbehaviors. Um, this is not bringing guns to school. This is not bringing drugs to school. And so that's why it's pretty low on this five point scale. But the point is, there's still a difference based solely upon what that student's race was. And so that gives us a what as it pertains to this hypothetical situation in which they're reading about this hypothetical student. And so what might this look like in real world context? So I went back to the data from the Department of Education for schools across the country. And this is what we found. They organized suspensions uh, by if a student had received a single suspension or multiple suspensions. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this because it's really a visual thing. Um, not gonna take a poll right now for the sake of time, which I'm trying to watch closely, but there will be more interactive components. Um, but the main takeaway here is just visual that these two graphs look eerily similar. The one on the left is the real world outcomes, the actual suspension rates throughout the country. The one on the right is this hypothetical situation. 
And what you're seeing is a sharper escalation for the black students compared to the white students. Uh, if you want to find out more about this, that, that experimentation and those comparisons using chi-square statistics, whatever, please feel free to follow the citation. Uh, Psychological Science is the premier psychological journal um, uh, from the scientific standpoint. Um, but yeah, the point being, eerily similar. But then we wanted to know why. Why might this process be happening? What is the process by which bias shapes decision-making? Um, and so ask teachers the extent to which they would say or, or label the student as a troublemaker. And they were significantly more likely to do so if the student was black compared to if the student was white. And so it appears to be the case that there's a label making process. And this is getting to that point about special education, that there's a label. And as you can imagine, there are a number of labels about people who are eligible for special education. Uh, there's the IEP idea in the first place, but then there's also the negative connotations that come with things like ADHD, uh, uh, conduct disorder. <coughs> Not going to go through all of them, but are labels that can lead us to believe that something is fixed. And, and, and that gets to some of the work by um, one of my advisors when I was at Stanford, Carol Dweck, that looks at growth and fixed mindsets. Growth mindset is when you think something can change. A fixed mindset is when you think it's st it sticks, it's stable, it's going to continue to happen. If you're a troublemaker in my class, you're going to be a troublemaker in somebody else's class. If you're a troublemaker today, you're going to be a troublemaker tomorrow, uh, and then acting accordingly. Um, and so it looks like there's that type of process going on. There's the view that the child is a troublemaker, uh, and in turn, we're seeing the difference in severity. Um, and what might that label making process be doing? We ask teachers the uh, 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 the extent to which the student's behavior was indicative of a pattern of misbehavior, and indeed they were more likely to think so if the student was black compared to white. And so what appears to be a primary function of stereotyping in this context is that it serves as glue that can stick together to otherwise unrelated infractions or misbehavior and make it more likely to look like a pattern over time. And we view that pattern like it's a fixed thing, and therefore the response being more severe discipline. That being the way that that teacher is interpreting that student's behavior. Um, and so if we put this in a schematic and come back to the idea of what can we do about this information, well, now we have more to work with. And so we have evidence that a rate, the race of a student uh, predicts the uh, likelihood that a teacher will predict suspension or want severe discipline. I can actually say that differently because of the way we measured it. A student's blackness, like degree of blackness, increases the likelihood that a response to their misbehavior will be uh, uh, punitive, uh, will be suspensions, things of that nature. However, what this experimentation also showed us, or, or, or just first, if this is all we knew, our only option would be to try to reduce people's bias or de-bias them, and that there is indeed room for work to be done to try to cut off that path. But because of the scientific method, that's not our only option. Now we know this, that a student's blackness increases the likelihood that that student will be seen as a troublemaker. And the extent to which educators view any child as a troublemaker, black, white, Asian, Latinx, whatever it may be, if they're viewed as a troublemaker in that fixed way, that increases the likelihood of a more severe disciplinary response. What this allows us now to do is to not necessarily focus on the direct path of the bias to the outcome, but rather what if we're able to cut off one of those other paths, like the extent to which a student's blackness increases the likelihood of them being a viewed as a troublemaker, or cutting off the path of if any child is viewed as a troublemaker, that the response be a punitive one. And so that last path is the one that I would like for us to focus on. And the way we think about it at a high level theoretically is what we're calling sidelining bias. Um, and this is research that uh, I did with uh, some of my PhD students. That's not Linda Darlingham, and that's her son, who's one of my PhD students here at Berkeley. Um, it was an amazing researcher and lawyer, um, but that that's published in Science Advances, the most rigorous scientific journal, uh, like I was telling you about earlier. But just to put it briefly, without all the experimentation, just on an idea level, I'm gonna walk through schematics here. And so for the typical situation, as we've been discussing, uh, there are those structural sources of bias that can uh, uh, manifest in or contribute to the biases that we harbor, which can then come out in systemic bias uh, on a structural level and interpersonal uh, types of bias and in how we interact with other people. 
And that the way that that all plays out um, is that process by which we're more likely to view a black student's misbehavior uh, to be indicative of a pattern or view that black student as a troublemaker, which then contributes to um, the discipline disparities that we see. And that that actually works in the fashion of a recursive cycle such that it just keeps happening. Um, and so since we have that, the, the reducing bias approach would look like this, in which the actual intervention or exercise happens early in this process. And the objective is to stop structural bias from turning into actual bias within people. And so that's a dotted arrow, because as we've gone through today, it still gets through. Uh, whether that be that approach just isn't effective or over time, the biases come back. And then ultimately we have the same process taking place, taking place, so maybe a little bit less for a little bit of time, it still goes back to or reverts back to uh, the original process. And so but what we're proposing here and what we found evidence for, which I'm going to share with you here on, um, is that it might be fruitful to think about how do we sideline bias, meaning how do we create a situation in which it's less likely that our bias cells will come out? How do we create situations in which bias can be rendered not functional, not useful, uh, or not even thought of or acted upon? And so main takeaways here is that the ways that we thought about doing this is one, perspective getting, uh, that it, it can be helpful that teachers have more of an opportunity and are better engaged with finding out what's going on with a student. What's the big picture? What's the whole child? What does this child think about what's going on? Um, and then also uh, on a mindset level, having more of a growth mindset about the extent to which students can learn self-control, that students can and do grow over time, and that that's exactly what's going on, an opportunity uh, uh, to get in there. Um, and that also a growth mindset uh, about oneself and the relationships that we have with students, that it's not just a bad relationship, it's always gonna be a bad relationship, but rather with effort and, and, and small changes and how we interact with students, that ultimately that relationship can become better over time. So having more of a growth mindset about both of those things, the idea being that this combination of approaches will make it less likely that there's a troublemaker labeling process in the first place, um, uh, uh, and sidelines those effects of bias, such that ultimately, there's improved discipline outcomes and that those improved discipline outcomes build on themselves such that ultimately there are large improvements in discipline outcomes um and so let me see how we're doing on time <sighs> yeah let's do really quickly in the chat just just quickly what comes to mind what you've been thinking how do you see this happening in your own experiences in your own classrooms um uh, uh and especially now when I can confirm across the country, students are coming back with more misbehavior. They are even farther behind academically and socially. A lot of them don't know how to interact in this context. Like the pandemic started when they were in eighth grade and now they're a, a, a sophomore or junior in high school. This is all a time in which you know, things are different. So for you right now, how do you see this process playing out? How do you see this happening in a real world context. So we'll just take a moment until we see a couple of these responses that I imagine we'll all be able to relate to. So I see restorative process and justice. Um, so I, I would say that that's very similar to the perspective getting component. The reconciliation part of restorative practices specifically is about finding out that student's perspective. And so structurally, it's creating a context in which a teacher can find out more about a student's perspective. Indeed, yep. Oh, sorry, honest, open, and open-hearted communicate. Perfect, exactly. And so when given the opportunity that there is uh, a situation in which we remember and want to indeed find out more about the student's pro, uh, perspective and respond in ways that can that are co uh, uh, conducive or, or come with a growth mindset that we are actually working towards uh, a better relationship with that student and that we can indeed see that that student can and does grow over time um, indeed uh, and so thank you and so just to come back to this because these will be the main takeaways here um, and i'll show you why is that the keys to this approach, this empathic mindset is 
perspective taking with student. And so that can be done on a structural level. That can also be done on just what we do. We just ask students why they're misbehaving when they misbehave, for example. But then also those changes in beliefs or mindsets that indeed students can and do grow all the time and that our relationships with them can grow all the time. And so to be clear, I don't think any of these things are news to you all. It's my understanding that people go into education for empathic reasons in the first place, because they want to help children learn and grow and become their best possible selves. I think nurses and educators clearly fall into that category of just the most empathic people that we have. However, any human is not always their goals. Any human is not always their values. Indeed, in times of conflict, those things might not be at the forefront of our minds. And science backs that up, especially when it comes to romantic relationships, someone that we love a great deal. In the moment of conflict, like a person steps out on their marriage, we're likely to see them as a cheater, a fixed thing, and not necessarily be remembering all the things that we want to invest and can invest in that relationship to change that behavior and work together and things of that nature. That's what marriage and family therapy is. I just saved you six years in grad school. Um, but the point being is that there's still things that we, we, we do exercises and things to make sure that these are the things that come to mind in the heat of the moment. And that the knee-jerk reaction is not a punitive one, but rather one that's more empathic in nature. And so we tested that in an experiment uh, where we're calling it growth in these graphs, but it's a combination of those three things that I just mentioned. And a key thing we wanted to look for and that we found is that this approach doesn't harm other students. It has a positive uh, impact on the students that are more likely to be the uh, recipients of bias or the victims of bias. Uh, however, it doesn't harm anyone for us to have these, these type of psychological processes and structures in place. Um, and just gonna go right to it. So we ran an experiment to test the extent to which this was happening. And so similar to the experiment we ran before, uh, teachers viewed a misbehavior. This time, every teacher viewed misbehavior by a Black student because we just wanted to see, is this even going to be beneficial in the way that we predicted? So that this thing that Black students are more likely to face, that it's strategically, surgically shifting that process. Um, and so after that, this time, instead of the questions like before, just straightforward ask them um, the extent to which they think the student is a troublemaker. And they were significantly less likely, I mean, sorry, first of all, when there was no intervention, and so our control group, you're saying that it's a replication of what we found before. Teachers were more likely to think that the student was a troublemaker if the student was black compared to white. However, when there was the intervention in place, you're saying that was completely eradicated, such that there was no increased likelihood of viewing the black student as a troublemaker, and this didn't harm a white student in any way, rather, it brought the level of equity down uh, 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 for both of them, uh, 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 at least a little bit. When it came to discipline severity, we saw a similar thing. Like before, if there's no approach like this, if there's no empathic mindset, there's that uh, racial disparity. However, that is substantially, significantly mitigated with this type of approach. Um, and so we didn't want to just stop there. Uh, because we don't, again, we try to think about the whole process, the whole relationship. And so we switched it on itself. And now we had uh, ran an experiment with students, uh, uh, freshmen in college, thinking about their high school experience. And so they're imagining themselves as now the person doing these things. You leave your seat to get tissues. Uh, uh, you get up and throw items away in this, in this way that can disrupt other students. Um, and then we actually took the uh, responses from that previous experiment because we asked teachers just what would you do? And so the teachers who were thinking in the default or a more punitive mindset said that they would assign detention, said that they would uh, 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 give threats that if the misbehavior continues that they'll send them to the office and indeed that they asked the principal to talk to the student. Um, and so there's a condition in which the students are told this is what your teacher did. The other condition, they're told that teachers responded in the way that the teachers with the empathic mindset said they would respond. They were more likely to say that they would ask the student why he's doing what he's doing and that they would rearrange the classroom to make it more conducive to better behavior. 
meaning they would move the student's desk closer to the wastebasket or move the wastebasket closer to the student's desk. Um, and so that's what we came to call empathic discipline. So, so it's still discipline, it's still doing something about the situation, but it's doing it in this empathic way. Um, and what we found really quickly is that these participants, we asked them the extent to which they uh, would feel respect with this teacher. And we found a huge effect, such that if the teacher had responded to their misbehavior with empathic discipline, they felt significantly more respect for that teacher or with that teacher. And just to put this in context, that slide with all the text and all the dots on it, I told you that that, that scale, um, the, the minimal effect would be a 0.3. And that that's where you were saying like the best case scenario for the reducing uh, bias types of approaches. So on that exact same scale, the size of this effect is 2.42, meaning this effect would not only be off your computer screen, would probably be on into the next room, like through the wall. And so I just wanna make sure we're putting this in perspective, but do keep in mind what they were measuring before was the extent to which you could get rid of people's bias. What we're measuring here is how a student feels. So it's actually bringing about a change in the relationship. It's bringing about that student's change and how they're viewing their relationship with their teacher. Uh, we also, uh, 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 asked students the extent to which they would want to behave well in class, and we found similar results. They were significantly more likely uh, to be motivated to behave well and follow instructions in that teacher's class if that teacher had responded to their misbehavior in that more empathic way. And so put in a schematic like one before, we see a direct path that an empathic mindset leads students to be more motivated. But what we're saying is that a teacher's empathic mindset translates to a student feeling more respect, and in turn, that leads to a student wanting to behave better. And so in effect, at least experimentally in controlled lab settings and hypothetical context, it did indeed change that process, that cycle. It's making it such that that's not a deterioration of the relationship over time. It's not an increase or escalation in disciplinary action, but rather the relationship maintains its integrity. Uh, and, 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 and that everyone benefits, but we're not gonna stop there. I don't wanna leave it with hypothetical and I didn't join this profession to just do lab studies. No, we went out and feel in the field and we tested this in a, a series of online modules uh, with teachers across three school districts here in the California Bay Area. Um, and we looked at year end suspension rates. And so it was a randomized controlled trial Either the teachers did a series of exercises about the empathic mindset, or they did a series of exercises about how technology helps to keep students engaged. And so it's still about the teacher-student relationship, but it is not about this empathic approach. Um, so that's what's called a conservative or, or strict uh, experimental design. And this cuts suspension rates by 50% across those three school districts. Just gonna take a moment with that because that, that, is, that is real. That is not a change in people's reported biases about certain groups. This is the real world outcome. And we're not talking five minutes later. We're not talking about 24 hours later. This is the entire school year, 50% reduction in suspension rates. And so as you may know, and it's common here in California, these, I can't say which school districts, but I can say um, this sample ended up being primarily Latinx students. And so we're seeing that for a student from a racially stigmatized or population of students of, uh, from a racially stigmatized group, that this is effective for them. Um, that this does lead to this difference in the real world outcome. Uh, 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 and if you wanna find out more about this research, it was published by the National Academy of Sciences uh, and that will be made available to you. Um, but also because it was published by the National Academy of Sciences, it got the attention of the White House and the US Department of Education back in 2016, um, and the US Department of Education recommended this as the number one way to combat, combat discipline problems throughout the country. That led to a number of school districts throughout the country to reach out to me to, for us to work together and collaborate. There's only so much time and resources to do that. <coughs> and so to run another randomized controlled trial with the scientific you know, method to see uh, is indeed this working um, and find out more about how it's working. I, selected a school district 
that's one of the top 10 largest school districts in the country. It's uh, the school district that makes up the Tampa Bay area. And so it'd be the equivalent of like, if the San Francisco Bay area was all one school district. That's what they have down in the Tampa Bay uh, area in Florida. And also with that much larger sample across many, many schools, um, we were able to get a much more diverse sample of students. Now we're talking about teachers across 20 schools uh, and a sample of, or, or, or them being uh, teachers for uh, approximately 6,000 students. And so looking at a very high level. Uh, and this time we're able to look at more things. And so back to the question we got earlier, we didn't just look um, uh, at racial disparities and discipline, um, uh, which we did because this was a racially diverse 17 cities. Um, but we also looked at special education. And so research shows, and, and we looked into it, and here are citations for sources that you can look into. Um, empathy may not be the default when it comes to students who uh, are eligible for special education. The default may be indeed feeling that this is going to be a consistent and ongoing problem, that this is going, that, you know, that fixed mindset we were talking about, and that in a teacher's position, wanting to keep their class on task, having a duty to keep their class on task, to reach benchmarks, to uh, complete lesson plans, things of that nature for the sake of all of the students in the classroom, it's more likely that uh, uh, discipline is approached in ways that ultimately remove that student uh, from the classroom by way of exclusionary discipline like suspensions. Uh, and so we're seeing, like I was saying before, uh, this connection. Um, uh, 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 such that, uh, or not connection, but just that there are multiple types of biases that can function in the same way. And so I'm going to show you results of what happened in the real world context. You don't have to go on theory. You don't have to go on anecdotes. I'm going to show you the math um, and, 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 and come back to the practical points. But just quickly, the math from, from that experimentation, um, we were able to look at race. I mean, we were able to look at suspension rates again, but for the entire school year, we were able to look at it by race um, on the East Coast or down in Florida. The, the term used is Hispanic, and that I took it straight from uh, their records. Um, and so, looking at whether a student was Black or Hispanic or not, um, able to look at it by history of suspensions, as you may know, and similar to the criminal justice system, the number one predictor of whether someone's going to get in trouble is have they gotten in trouble before. And so we were able to look at, had they received one or more suspensions the previous school year? And we we're also able to look at whether or not students had special education status. So what you're saying is that if you look at the gray or, or bluish bars, that's the control condition in which it would just be the default. And what you're saying, for example, Black and Hispanic students significantly more likely to be suspended than other students, Students with one previous suspension or more than one previous suspension, very much more likely to be suspended uh, than students who had not received a suspension the previous year. And then when you look at disability status, uh, students who are eligible for special education are more likely to be suspended than their peers. So here, just on that alone, the what? Yes, those correlations are indeed there, um, that these groups are at a heightened risk of suspension and maybe a less uh, it may be less likely by default that they receive empathy. But then when you look at the green ones, you're seeing that if their teacher had this empathic mindset, those disparities are significantly mitigated, such that now we're seeing that um, uh, significantly less, or, or Black and Hispanic students are significantly less likely to be suspended. Students with a history of suspension significantly less likely to be suspended that school year, and the same uh, for special education status. Um, and so it appears that this indeed, the processes I've told you about today are real uh, and that looking at these type of uh, processes and strategically, surgically looking at what can be done about them, uh, we've been able to do that. And they, none of the materials tell, they, they don't even mention bias, they don't, they don't talk about bias. Um, they also don't tell people not to suspend students. This isn't a, a, a policy approach. This isn't a ban on suspensions. Nowhere in it did it say discipline or suspensions are bad. The material is very much pinpoint and hone into how do we psychologically create a situation in which there's that different mindset and that that different mindset is the one that's more likely to come up 
in times of conflict <coughs> or when misbehavior comes I Sorry, I think you're witnessing COVID happening to me. <laughs> sorry, I said my daughter tested positive yesterday. Um, <clears throat> but we're going to make it. Anyway, um, and so this is very promising. Before I stop and then open it up to question and answers, I just want to touch on some takeaways, but also one more very promising and interesting finding. With this sample, we were also able to follow up with the outcomes on into a second or subsequent school year. And so looking at um, students who had a teacher with this empathic mindset, what happened the next school year when they no longer had that teacher and they had all new teachers and peers that they had to interact with? And what we found is that overall across all students, there persisted to be a reduction in suspension rates in that second year. Um, and that also there's that significant mitigation of the racial disparities um, in suspension rates um, on into that second year. And I can tell you now, it's the same for special education status. Um, and so it appears to be the case that this effect is sticky, meaning that students take it with them on into other classes, on into the, uh, future school years. And that just speaks to the, the, the psychological prowess of this type of approach. It also speaks to how the default may be particularly problematic for contextual reasons. Not that teachers are bad, but what just comes with the context around their position and what we ask of them to do. And so just quickly, main takeaways. These are things that are a lot taken exactly from the teachers, the hundreds of teachers we've been working with over the years. Things that they've said when they have that empathic mindset are things like, I try to greet every student at the door with a smile every day, no matter what has occurred the day before. Or another teacher said, I never hold grudges. I try to remember that they are all the son or daughter of someone who loves them more than anything in the, more, in the world. They are the light of someone's life. Another response was, I answer their questions thoughtfully and respectfully, no matter what their academic history with me has been. And then finally, another teacher shared, I hold every student accountable to the same rules and standards of behavior. And so creating just a standard of equity that they would come back to. And so we uh, have put all of this together into a package that we call empathic instruction. Uh, you have or you will receive more information about this approach, but essentially we've gotten to the point where we've done the science, we've done the research, you've just seen it, it's there. Um, it's published in the top scientific journals, if you don't take my word for it. Um, but that we've created it in a way that school districts can actually take it up and use it. All the teachers get the, 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 the benefits of it there is no control group um and that it can be done in an efficient way that doesn't put extra stuff on teachers plates which is they already have a lot um and so it could be one session uh in the in the in the fall or winter or it could be a series of two uh one in the fall one in the winter they're very digestible sessions done online and so teachers can do it uh, during what is otherwise a professional development situation and so it's that same amount of time about 40 minutes or 30 minutes. Um, other districts have set it up such that teachers, they can just participate from their computer wherever they have internet. So they can do it during their, 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 their planning period. They can do it after school. They can do it on Saturday from the, the leisure of their own homes um, within whatever the participation window is. And that at the end, we then go to that district and report back exactly what was found, uh, exactly how these processes played out in that school district. Uh, and give presentations and whatever it may be to any stakeholders, whether that be their board of education, their teachers union. It's, it's actually a lot of the time teachers unions that ask us to come in and take this approach because we are no, like you say, we are no way of pointing any fingers at teachers saying that what they're doing is wrong. What we're doing is trying to provide uh, uh, processes that will be effective that teachers can take with them psychologically and practically and then apply and have real world results. Um, and so I just wanted to make sure before we ended that for this, this group and, and for my colleagues here in California and where my children will be going to school, um, this is available now. And I have my team in this meeting as well. Um, if you want to find out more, there's information in the chat uh, and we're happy to hear about more. And so finally, as promised, we're going to come to a question and answer. Um, and the point being is that while we can think about reducing bias, it may be interesting or useful 
to focus more or focus also on the context around bias and how do we become the architects of context to make situations in which bias is rendered not functional in order to help children learn and grow and become their best possible selves in order to reach those empathic goals that we had to become teachers in the first place has no room for bias um and that you know as i've walked through this you see all of the evidence-based science uh that backs this up and so i'll leave this slide up here for a moment uh in case anyone wants to write it down and 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 i want to thank uh, the Department of Education for the state of California, uh, as well as specifically um, colleagues over at Napa, uh, like Connie, who introduced me. Thank you so much. And I will let Connie take it from here for which questions I, I will answer for the rest of our session today. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much, Jason. I, I'm seeing all of the wonderful um, gratitude comments in the in chat. I mean, people obviously are very moved by what you had to share, um, not only because you do a wonderful job of sharing it, it's research that is, as you said, lots of numbers, but you put it into terms that we can all take away something in terms of what can be done going forward. You make it very real, which obviously it is. It's very real in terms of its impact on students and teachers. Um, there are a couple questions that I wanna make sure we have an opportunity to address and let me see there was one about how do you measure teacher mindset in the inter intervention so if you can say a little bit about how that actually was measured that would be great mm -hmm. sure uh so in a number of ways uh, i mean we looked at the overall outcome based upon um which students had which teachers and so just the real world outcome of what changed there but specifically about the mindset it's embedded in the actual online modules because we're asking teachers their views on different contexts and different ideas. We're asking for their feedback on things like I've shown you today, the science behind these things. Again, it's not about bias. It's more about the science behind empathy, for example. Um, uh, uh, and that there, we can use the responses to that, whether they be quantitative or qualitative, to create a comprehensive measure of that mindset. Right. So kind of related to that, someone asked a question, um, as you said, that this could extend to other areas. And so uh, Shane, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, she asked, how does empathic mindset inform teacher expectations regarding academic instruction and performance? That's a good question, especially I would say when it comes to things like special education, because as a psychologist in training, I know for a fact there are different firings of neurons in the brains. There are different biological things that can make for different scenarios and different approaches that we need to take. And so I would say the way that it comes in to play with teacher expectations, it wouldn't necessarily, or it's not geared towards being some blanket idea that like, you should just be able to like, I don't know, for some reason, care bears just came to mind, but you just solve all problems with the same like shot of love or something. It doesn't always look the same. Empathy, and, I, and thank you for this question, because I think this is a very important, very important point. Oftentimes when I use that term, people think of sympathy. Sympathy is where you just um, uh, 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 yeah, sympathy is where you just imagine what someone might be going through. And, and this is the way I distinguish it. Empathy is where you don't imagine. You ask and you find out and you do the whole thing, do full on research to find out what is that person's perspective? What are they going through? Not just what would it feel like to walk around in their shoes, but where did they buy their shoes? How many shoe stores are there in their neighborhood? What size shoe do they wear? How big is their closet? Do they have a closet? How often do they walk? Like really getting in there and that that type of, uh, uh, and that that's what we mean by empathic mindset, that, for, that you're really considering the individuality and humanity of individual students just remembering to do that because it can get difficult um that that's what i would say about expectations just be ready to be flexible yeah. mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so this is an interesting question from um dr ann gregory which she asks um how do you see the empathic instruction intervention interfacing with school discipline policy are we likely to see changes is that Dr. Ann Gregory from Rutgers? I oh my gosh. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, she's been here the whole time? Okay, yeah. I'm glad you told me that now, so I wouldn't have been nervous. <laughs> so Ann Gregory has amazing work on this topic. My teacher partner, um, I can't say enough about it, also published in the top journals. Um, it's like having, 
she can tell you about it. But having teacher coaches and uh, analyzing the way that you're interacting with students, um, all of these things, I, I'm a huge fan of. And Gregory, to answer the question, I think that it's important to strategically integrate policy interventions and this type of psychological approach, and that each of these alone can do the work, but it's important that they're done together to bring the largest and most lasting effects. And so I think it's great that we've banned willful defiance as a reason for students to be suspended. But then when I talk to teachers here in California, um, while it's, we've seen a huge reduction in suspension rates in California, we still see disparities are still there based on race, based on gender, based on the number of these different biases. Um, but that also would a byproduct is that teachers may just be and school leaders less likely to make it formal suspensions. Um, this has been conversations I'm having where it's more like, okay, I'll send the student to another classroom or into the hallway, or I'll call the student's parents directly and have them come pick them up. All of those things still remove the student from a learning environment, but now we just don't know how often it's happening. And so what's important is that when we do that type of policy approach, that we also consider that like, well, we still need to give teachers something that they can do. Misbehavior is still gonna happen. Willful defiance is still gonna happen. Um, and so what can we do with that? Well, here's a, a, an approach, here's a way of thinking about it, in a way that not just handles the immediate thing that's happening, um, but also creates a situation in which respect is maintained, trust is maintained, and that ultimately that student wants to behave better in your class and other classes. Um, and so all that to say, I 100% think that these things should be uh, done as a part of a strategic package. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. And you know, you just touched on what Margaret mentioned, which was wondering how this might work in terms of what our districts call silent suspension. So exactly what you were describing, those that aren't formal, right? At the early ed level. So if we could get early educators, early childhood educators, um, this help as soon as possible. <laughs> I love this group. Yeah. I mean, for multiple reasons, I hope, I mean, I wish that my daughter didn't get COVID, but because of it, I, I'm, I'm gonna have to go at exactly 1.30. I wish we could just keep talking. Yeah. Margaret, please reach out to me. I'm very much interested in that. It's not something that there's research on. It's not something that a lot of people are even aware of. I am only aware of it from working directly with you know, certain school districts um, and specifically at the preschool level uh, that yeah, it appears to be there's something going on there. And for those of you who don't know, silent suspensions is like an example at the preschool level of what I was just describing, where you're still removing children from the learning environment um, but it's not a formal suspension, hence the cool name, silent suspension. It's still happening in which you just call a parent in that level, for example, uh, and tell them your child is crying uncontrollably. There's nothing we can do about it. You need to come pick them up. Um, that child is, ends up being less likely to return mm -hmm. to the classroom or the school for preschool or TK. Um, so, yes, please reach out to me. I, I do think these same processes apply, um, but we are looking into how to create an approach that looks specifically at that and looks at it at a preschool level. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop here, even though we have a, a few more, but I really, really want to thank you, Jason, so much for being here today. This is incredible information that we all need right, right now. And many folks have mentioned that in terms of our current um, pandemic and the ways in which our, our students need even more empathy. Our adults need more empathy. We all need to really focus in this way right now, probably more so than ever, at least in the time I've been here in education. Um, I, I really wanna respect people's time and we have a couple of things we would like to ask of you. One is we always wanna get feedback on our webinars and we'll be giving uh, a follow-up, but we're also gonna, you'll see, you'll see the poll up there. Just two quick questions. We would love to hear from you responses to those two questions and hopefully you can just take a minute to do that. Um, again, we want to know how this was helpful and um, want to make sure that we're always providing you the best information that we can and useful information. And then the other thing is in chat, you will also see a link that will come up for um, a, a little bit lengthier, but only, still only a question or two in terms of some narrative feedback that would be helpful for us as we continue to try to provide information that's the most useful to you. And we will be doing a follow-up email, just so all of you know, as Jason said, he mentioned several um, important 
uh, other ways in which you can get information and we'll definitely make sure that that's provided to you in writing following this uh, webinar. Uh, once again, thank you so much everyone for your time. We know how especially valuable it is right now. Jason in particular, we love having you and uh, I know people are gonna be reaching out and there'll be even more of this good work happening throughout California. Very happy to know that. So, and best to you and your families, you all get healthy soon, okay? All right. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, and we will be in touch. Bye-bye. Okay.